way. You know what I'm saying? But it was because, he said, the reason he was healing the sick was because he loved the sick. It had nothing really to do with me other than I was just available. And I was believing that they were going to get healed. But he said, I love them and I will deal with you later. Do you understand? There's so much out there and the church has gotten so weak and lukewarm and anything goes on and I'm telling you, even at this point now where m most of what is being passed off as supernatural in the church, it is supernatural but it is, it's new age it is familiar spirits it is people doing things because you can't live an unholy life and think that you're going to operate in any of the gifts of the Spirit and it's going to be the gift of the Holy Spirit operating purely through you. Yeah? Familiar spirits can give you what appears to be a word of knowledge. You understand? And many people operating in so-called words of knowledge is, or, or word, you know, prophetic words is nothing more than a, than a, spirit, a familiar spirit. Nothing more than a demon. You know, honestly, I could get into some things, you know, and name some names. I'm not going to because it has to do with sin, people, and that kind of, when that's between them and God. Okay? I'm not afraid to. I'm just saying I'm, I'm waiting till everything settles to know where they stand. Now, based on what I see, I'm glad I took the stand I did when I did because I stood against it. Okay? Because I knew something ain't right there. Something ain't right. Now, but the only way that's going to change is if we, people in the church, begin saying, I am not going to support this. I'm not going to show up. If these people are there, I'm not going. And you start making a stand. Because there's no need to change if nothing's going to change if you don't change. Does that make sense? Yes. And... <clears throat> I'm saying that because I want you to understand. When we talk about the anointing, I, I, well, I'll tell you what, why don't we go ahead and take the break? When we come back, we'll talk about the anointing. All right? What time is it? 3.20? Yeah. All right, let's take about 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Verses very quickly. Now, I'm going to have to read through these kind of quick, and we're going to have to hurry. All right? Because I want to get this done. I want to get you to this next part. And the reason it's taking a little long is one thing, we've gone into a couple of things here, but I really felt like we needed to. But secondly, I'm, I'm giving you some scripture that I don't always bring out. Okay? It will be in the new manual, but I didn't get it into this one yet. So I'm giving you the material, but it's just not there. So it's a little different. Now, Hebrews chapter 8, starting in verse 6, it says, But now has he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Right? I'm emphasizing that better part. Right? Better covenant. Now, which was established upon better promises. Okay? Do you realize the new covenant has better promises than the old covenant? Alright? So quit trying to live under the old covenant. Now, the new covenant is better and has better promises. So quit trying to go back and be an old covenant saint. Because here's the thing. That, remember I was telling you about Paul when he wrote Galatians. The problem is when you... If you read through Galatians and what we've said earlier. If you go back under the law. Then you are responsible for every point of the law. You understand? You, you can't just say, well I'm in a new covenant. And I'm going to go back to the old covenant. And I'm going to pick out the old covenant parts that are blessings. And I'm not going to take any of the other stuff with it. Right? You can't do that. If you go back under the law, then you are responsible just like Moses and all of the early Hebrews were, were responsible for every point of the law. And if you violate one point, you are guilty of the entire law. Do you understand that? Now, if you break one law, now we have, you know, uh, misdemeanors and felonies and that kind of stuff. But... In the overall, I mean, if you just look at it, if you break one law, you are a criminal. Amen. You understand? 
And people say, yeah, but that didn't matter. No, see, that's the problem. You break a law, and if there was a policeman standing there, you would get charged. Amen? You get a ticket, you get arrested, right? So it doesn't matter the level of law that you break. If you break a law, you are a criminal. Right? Well, it's the same thing under God's law. If you violate one point, you are a criminal guilty of the whole law. Do you understand? And when you try to go back under the law, especially as a new covenant Christian, and you try to go back... Now, see, this is why Paul wrote in Hebrews. He said, look, he said, if we willfully sin after having come to the truth and having tasted of the powers of being and and the, the next world and all that, he says, then you go back, and what it says, if you do that, then you, and he says, there is, therefore, after that, no more sacrifice for sin. You understand? In other words, he's saying, and, and then he, and he tells him, and people, I've had people come in, you know, Curry, I, I've broken, I have uh, committed the unpardonable sin because I sinned willfully. I was baptized in the Spirit, I was born again, and I've sinned, I, 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 I know I shouldn't have done it, but I went back out into sin and, did, and I've committed the unpardonable sin. And, and, and you know, I just don't know what to do. And I said, all right, first off, no you haven't. Okay? Because I said, the fact, if you had committed a sin that is unpardonable, then the Holy Spirit would not be dealing with you. And the fact that the Holy Spirit is convicting you of that sin, it proves that He's still dealing with you, which means you can still repent and come back. Right? So you've not done that. And say, yeah, but it says after we've sinned willfully. I said, all right, first off, you have to understand, what was Paul talking about? He said, he went on to say, if we willfully sin after that, there's no more sacrifice of sin, and we trample underfoot the blood of Christ. Now, what, the reason Paul wrote that, he was not writing to, you know, Gentiles that didn't know what was going on. It's written to the Hebrews. And what the sin they were committing, now get this, the sin they were committing willfully was going back under the law. Wow. Do you understand? That's the sin. They went back under the law. And that's why Paul said, if you do that, if you sin willfully by, by going back to the law for your righteousness, then there is no more sacrifice of sin because you are treading underfoot the blood of Christ saying that wasn't enough. And that now you have to be perfected by going to the temple, going to the law, doing everything just right, keeping the feast, doing everything like you're supposed to. And you're saying that what you're doing is having more effect than the blood of Jesus. And if you believe that, then the blood of Jesus is useless and it will not cleanse you from any further sin and therefore you're back in sin and the blood of Christ is not saving you. It had nothing to do with a a Christian deciding afterwards, you know, after they've spoken tongues, that now, okay, I'm going to go out and get drunk or something like that. That was not what he was talking about. He was talking about Christians going back under the law. Paul's big deal was not individual sins, right? His big thing was don't neglect Christ and go back to the law for your righteousness because you are denying Christ. You're saying you can go do something that's going to have more effect and more good for you than the blood of Jesus and what he did. That's Paul's big deal. Alright? That was his big thing in his writings. Now, the reason it says that, and so I want you to realize, that's why I keep telling you, don't don't play with that old covenant stuff. Don't play with it. Don't, Don't go back into the law. Don't look at the law. You've been freed from the law. If you go, see, the law has a curse attached to it. If you put yourself back under the law, you put yourself back under the curse. You understand? Now, and you say, okay, do I lose my salvation? Not even going there, but I'm telling you, I would question your salvation if you try to find some other way to be blessed or to get righteous with God. That means you don't understand how you get righteous because you're righteous by the blood of Jesus and by the blood alone. You understand? You can't do anything to make you right. You, the only thing you could do is accept Him. And you've done that. So now don't neglect Him and try to add to it. You cannot add to the blood of Jesus. 
You understand? You cannot. So don't go back and don't let any of these TV preachers seduce you into following that kind of stuff. You see, you've got to realize, this is not, well, it's either or. Well, you know, I, just, I don't think it's that big a deal. Paul said in the last days, men are not going to, to, they're not going to cling to, to good, true, right doctrine. He said wolves are going to sneak in. Wolves are going to come in. And they're going to bring doctrines of devils. You read Timothy. He said, this is the way it's going to be in the end. Day. They're going to be lovers of self. They're going to be lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. They're always going to be learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. You hear that? Come on, that describes today perfectly. And he says, when that happens, he said, when that's going on, he said, there are going to be doctrines of devils that are going to be used to try to seduce the people of God away. And he told Timothy, beware of that. Watch this. And he's telling us the same thing. Because we know one thing for sure. If Timothy was in the last days, we're in the last days. Right? Because it's not getting any earlier. Right? And so we know we're there. So we have to realize this. this. This is not something you can play with. That we're talking about heaven or hell, life or death. We're talking about eternity. You understand? And so it says that these people are going to seduce you. They're going to they're come in in cunning craftiness. It even says that in Ephesians also. That he said, you know, they're, they're going to lie in wait. They're going to they're lie to you. They're going to try to deceive you. And he said, don't... Now he, and he tells them, don't, you know, be... How can I say it? Um, you don't want to be just... Well, same way Paul said. Don't be tossed to and fro. But see, that's the problem. You, people will go to church and they have no foundation. They don't know what... They don't even know the basics of the truth. And yet they want to get to the deep things? Come on, you don't even know the basics. You know, the, 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 what Jesus even called the basics. And mercy and goodness and, and, and doing what's right and treating people right and, and then even the basic doctrines of the faith. And right now there is a group. They've invited me to join them. About every three months I get a letter. And they're saying, oh, please join us, join us. You know, and we'll, somebody will sponsor you to join. All that kind of stuff. I'm like, thank you, no thank you. And at one time, I actually kind of considered, and I thought, okay, it'd be good because if we can get our message into them, okay, that, that'd be worth joining. And then God said, don't you do it. You don't join with them. You don't have anything to do with them. And they, they've already, right now, they've already said, there is no rapture. Okay? I mean, flat out. Now, okay, rapture is debatable. I know people can say, yeah, no, okay. Okay, you want to debate on rapture? Fine. Well, now they're fixing. <laughs> you can tell them from the side. They're fixing. You know, not I-N-G, just I-N. Fixing. All right, no, no G on the end, just fix it. Okay, but at least you all understand what I'm talking about, right? Okay, you didn't, you didn't call me here to teach you English. Okay, <laughs> so, so, so don't write me no letters or any that kind of stuff. But uh, let me say, they're about to release, okay, a statement where now they're saying there's no second coming. All right, they've already. <laughs> They've already endorsed an adulterer. Alright? And they say, it's okay. And matter of fact, now that he's remarried, it's even better okay, and he's going to come back into ministry. Alright? Now, I, I believe in restoration. Now, I don't, I, there's not a whole lot of things, you know, that should keep a person out of ministry per se. But, if we don't start standing up to Bible standards and start telling people, look, you make a choice... And if you make a wrong choice, it's going to cost you. And if you make a big enough wrong choice, forget ministry. Because you will not come back into ministry. No one's going to listen to you, and we're going to do our best to make sure no one hears you. You understand? When we start putting standards like that, people will start thinking twice before they start sneaking off to the hotel. Because they're going to realize, if I get caught, this is going to cost me. But as long as it doesn't cost, then it's okay. Oh, well, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, oh, well, that's okay. You've been out of ministry three weeks? Get back behind the pulpit. We need to get you back in there as quick. You're too valuable a gift to the body. That's a lie. See, again, that comes back to, well, look at the anointing on him. He is somebody. He is, he is called. He is anointed. That is all a lie. Do you understand? It is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. 
And we have to realize that the anointing is nothing... Let me, let me explain it to you. The anointing is real simple. You're not going to get any more anointed ever than you are right now. Alright? You are as anointed as you will ever be. There's no more anointings coming. Alright? There's no more... God's not going to dump any more on you. Nothing like that. He's not going to add anything. None of that happened. You can't find that in the Bible at all. Alright? That is all modern tradition. It is not there. Now, you say, well then... You're telling me everybody's the same has the same anointing? Yep. Everybody has the same anointing. Everybody, it's the same anointing. There's no difference in anointing. Now, now there, there's difference of offices. There's differences of gifts. But not differences of anointing. Alright? 1 John 2.27, you don't have to turn there. You can or you can write it down. But it just says, You have received an anointing that abides. Alright? So, so first off, that tells us the anointing that we have, and we have all... Because he was writing to the group. So everybody there had it. You understand? <clears throat> he didn't write to some people and say, some of you, he didn't say, listen, some of you have received an anointing that abides. But there's some of you that haven't. He didn't say that. He said, you have received an anointing that abides. So the anointing you have, number one, every Christian has it. Number two, it's an anointing that abides. That means it's an anointing that stays. That means it doesn't lift. Well, the anointing has lifted. Okay, that's a lie, or at least wrong. Okay, I'm not going to say they're lying. I, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt they were taught wrong. Okay, the anointing doesn't come and go. Okay, let me, let me explain to you why the anointing doesn't come and go. Who is Jesus? Son of God, the Christ, right? What does Christ mean? The anointed one. Now, if Christ is the anointed one, and Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Can you have the anointed one in you and you not be anointed? Now, so if the anointing leaves, then that means that Jesus is no longer the Christ in you. He's just Jesus. Is he the anointed one or is he not? He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That means the anointed one's in you means the anointing's in you means the anointing doesn't leave. This idea about, well, the anointing is lifted. The anointing, oh, anointing fall. The anointing doesn't fall. Okay? He is a person. You don't have a part of a person. You have him. You don't have part of him. You have all of him. Right? You, do you understand that? You don't have part of him. It, the Bible says that in Jesus was what? The fullness of the Godhead. That's in Jesus. You remember those little Russian babushka? babushka? You know what I'm talking about? The, what, yeah. The, that one. What she said. Okay? I'm, I'm Texan. I'm going to stay there. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? They're, they're big, and you open them up, and there's another one inside. You open it up, there's another one inside. Okay. That was divinely inspired. That's who you are. Father's in Jesus. Holy Spirit's in Jesus. Jesus is in you. So in you is the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Right? Now, all of the fullness of God is in Jesus. Is he not? Jesus is in you. So what's in you? all of the fullness of the Godhead. Right? I told you, religion drew a line. you got to decide if you're going to step over it. Now, I'm not saying you're God. Okay? Don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that at all. all right? Anyone that's God does not have to rely on anyone else. But He is the vine and we're the branch. Without Him, we have no life. So we can't be God because we rely on Him to have our life. But he doesn't rely on us. You understand what I mean? He doesn't need us to exist, but we need him to exist. So that means he's God and we're not. Okay, lesson number one, that's the main one you need to learn. Okay? Now, but the good thing is, God doesn't mind you acting like God as long as you remember you're not him. See, it's when you start thinking you're him, that's when you get in trouble. But as long as you act like him, he doesn't care. The Bible even says, be imitators. Be followers of God as dear children. Be imitators of God. You imitate him. As dear children. It means, in other words, you act just like him. What he, what, well, the way he acts, you act. Right? He doesn't mind you acting like him as long as you remember you're not him. Okay? You're his representative, so you have to act like him. Now, a representative means to represent, to re-present. So, if I'm a representative of Jesus, I have to represent Jesus to the world. If I present a Jesus that is not the same Jesus that they saw the first time, I'm not representing him, I'm presenting a new Jesus. You know, is that right? So I have to represent the same Jesus that was here the first time. 
Anything less, and I'm not representing, I am misrepresenting. Okay? All right, let's move on. Now, <clears throat> Jesus lives in you, the fullness of God is in him, and of his fullness have we all received. You hear that? Of his fullness have we all received. Now, the Bible says, and uh, this is again, these are, see, we read scriptures wrong because we have to, to maintain our wrong doctrine. And after a while, we read over them like it actually says the way we misread it. And so, when it says that in him, let's say, yeah, we'll go back to 1 John 2, 27, that you have received an, an anointing that abides. It, it, it abides. It doesn't come and go, doesn't lift, doesn't wane, doesn't get stronger, doesn't get weaker. Now, it says that, remember when Jesus said, or it said about Jesus, it said, um, he that speaks the word, or yeah, he that speaks the words of God, uh, to him was given the spirit without measure. Right? Well, basically, because, well, what it says is, because God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. That's what the King James read. But the actual Greek says, for God giveth not the spirit by measure. Unto him isn't in there. So basically what it says is, if you speak the words of God, the spirit of God, Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. Right? You speak the word of God, you're speaking the spirit of God. When you speak out the Spirit of God, the Word of God, then that Spirit is without measure because it's the Spirit of God. The Spirit, you can't measure the Spirit of God. You understand? You, you can't measure a person. Okay? That He is fullness. We try to say, well, I have this measure and you have that measure. No. We have the same measure of faith, but, and, and we have the Spirit, but the Spirit is given without measure, the Bible says. Now, we've read other stuff in it. What it says is, to him he gives the Spirit without measure, so that must mean that the Spirit can be given with measure. No, with measure, or without measure, isn't in there. The Spirit's given without, or without him is in there. Do you understand what I'm saying? Am I totally confusing you? <laughs> what, what, it, what it's basically saying is, you have the Spirit. You have all the Spirit, and there's no part of the Spirit you don't have. Do you understand? And every one of you has the Spirit, and all the Spirit, and, every, and not one of you doesn't have all of the Spirit, so He can't give you more. Okay, now, the reason I'm saying that is because I want you to understand that the Spirit, you go back up to 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, and it says, but you have an unction from the Holy One. Right? And He, and he actually says, and you have no need that any man teach you. Now, you think, okay, well, wait a minute now. Uh, is, are you sure you want to quote that verse, Curry? Because we're all here listening to you. Right? But the, the thing, it doesn't say, because remember he gave us the fivefold ministry to teach, build the body, and do what it's supposed to do. But, if, I, if we have the anointing, if I have the anointing, that word unction in the Greek is anointing. What it says is you have an unction, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you have no need that any man teach you. Okay? Now, you say then, if we don't need any man to teach us, why are we here? Well, because if I do my job right, it's not a man teaching you. See, it's the Spirit of God. If I say the words of God and say his, what Jesus said, His words are spirit and they are life. You're not learning from a man, you're learning from the Spirit of God. Jesus said, if you receive the one I send, you receive me. Isn't that right? See, if you don't believe what I'm teaching, there's a whole lot of scriptures you can't believe. You just can't believe them. You just have to ignore them. Our problem is we have developed ignoring them to a high art. Right? And we call it theology. Now, now get this. Because people say, because, well, I want this anointing. I want that anointing. I want, I want this. I want this. I want more anointing. I want a greater anointing. I want all this stuff. And I'm telling you, you have Jesus. You have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You have the fullness of God in you. You have the Spirit of God in you. You don't need anything added to you you have the Spirit in you, He's there. And I'm telling you, you all have it, and you all have the same anointing. You say, but aren't there different gifts? Yeah. But those gifts are not anointings, they're gifts. Okay? You're calling everything an anointing. It, which is kind of funny because, you know, on Sunday morning, a good singer is anointed. But on Saturday night, when they're singing in the bar, they're just talented. Wow. You know what I'm saying? And don't think some of them don't do that. Okay? Believe me, they do. And so, we just need to realize. Okay? Now, do I need another battery already? Nope. We're good.
just the prince of the power of the air trying to stir up things. <laughs> yeah. Now, so I want to explain to you the, the anointing. We'll come back to this later, actually tomorrow toward the afternoon. We'll get into this in detail. Here's how the anointing works. You say, but everybody can't be anointed to the same degree. Okay? If Jesus said the same works he did and greater works will he do, then everybody, and everybody can do that, then everybody's anointed to the same degree. Right? Makes sense, right? Okay. Now, you say, but I know people that are not anointed. And I know other people that are highly anointed. Okay, here's the difference. What you know is you know some people that are more dead than others. Okay? Okay. You women especially, and some of you men too, that if you like to cook or something, I, I don't have time for it. But you go to the store, you get an onion. You bring the onion back home, sit it on your table or your cab cabinet or counter or something. Okay, onion sits there. It doesn't fill up the house with the smell. It just sits there, right? But you go in, you take a knife, and you cut, and you open that onion up. It smells out, right? Now, did the smell... Was the smell created with the cutting? No. It was released with the cutting. Right? Now, if you take that onion, and the onion has layers. Let's say you hadn't cut it. Just sitting there. And you start taking it and you peel it layer by layer. The more layers... Now, we know that the stronger, if you want to call it an aroma, is toward the heart of the onion. Right? The, the closer you get to the heart, the stronger the aroma. <clears throat> now, it's not stronger, it's just that's the heart of the onion. That's where it's all centered, right? So it's really not any stronger. But as you peel those layers, the, the aroma gets stronger. The closer you get to the heart of the onion, the stronger the aroma is, right? Now, is the aroma gaining strength? No. It's being released because you're peeling off layers. Right? So the aroma slash anointing doesn't increase. But the more layer Now humans are like onions. You got layers. And the more you peel off the layers, the more you die to self, the more you die to things, the more you die to your ambitions and come alive to God's ambitions. You know what Jesus said? If you lay down your life and take up my life, He's, in, in the original Greek, the fullness of that even goes on to say, if you will set aside your ambitions, your desires, and pick up my ambitions and my desires. Isn't it right? That's what he's talking about. He said, if you lay down your life, I'll give you my life. That's the whole idea of Christianity. So the point is, we're like onions. The anointing is there. But you can't see it until you start peeling layers. But the more layers you peel off. Now, it's not getting stronger. It's just that it's getting closer to the surface. Right? Because we're removing the surface until it's close to the surface. That's the anointing. Christ, the anointed one, the anointing abides in you. You have received an anointing that abides in you. Now, why don't we see it more in people? Too many layers of self. Too many people haven't died yet. Do you want more of the anointing? It's not more anointing. It, okay, John the Baptist... I must decrease so he can increase. I must be peeled off so that he can be more seen. Isn't that right? Do you understand? That's the secret to the anointing. And you say, well, but I know some people that walk in the anointing and they're not dead. Okay. They may not be dead everywhere, but in certain areas, they know how to die to allow it to come out there. It's like taking a knife and cutting a hole in the onion and letting it come out. There may be a whole lot of life there, but they have learned by faith to activate and release that anointing. And the problem is, we had, now this is the church's fault. This, ain't, this isn't necessarily the, always the preacher's fault. <clears throat> but when you see a preacher, as we would say, highly anointed or used of God, then we put them on a pedestal and we build them up to where we cause them to think that they're celebrities. And then they start acting like celebrities and start thinking, well, you know, unless I, have it, unless I stay in a five-star hotel, I'm not coming. I, you know, I, you're going to have to give me, 
One preacher, actually, we talked to one time. He, yeah, well, oh, I got to have a fifty thousand dollar honorarium to even think about coming. And and I told him, I said, brother, your gift ain't worth that much. Real plain, you know. And so, <clears throat> it, it's just we have to realize at some point. This, and this is just a by the way. It's don't don't. I'm not telling you to go study this or anything, but you'll appreciate this. <clears throat> if you look up. Well, don't, don't do it. Don't even have to go there. Okay, but a minister. You read the Bible many times. Remember when Jesus stood up and got the book? And he said when he finished, he closed the book and handed it back to the minister. Okay, the word minister, you know, means servant. Right? One who serves. Now, you translate that, one who serves, into Japanese. You know what it is? Samurai. The word samurai means one who serves. And get this, a samurai, and, and if you go back into, um, what was it, Hagakure, I guess it was, the, the, yeah, yeah, uh, and even into the Bubishi, which is the Bible of the samurai, Bible of warriors, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, it says in there, a samurai, to be a samurai, is to walk the way of death. It says a true samurai well, every morning from the time he gets up, will do everything in alignment as though that day was the day he would die. He lived every day knowing this and, and acting as if this is my last day. Now, take that and transfer that to Christianity. Imagine if Christians got up every morning and dressed... Did everything, looked in the mirror, combed the hair... When, when Samurai went to, to battle... They would, first, before they put all the armor on, they would comb the hair back, put it in the, in the top knot, and then they would take perfume and put it either in the helmet or in their hair. Now, this, these are men warriors. As a matter of fact, they grew mustaches on purpose so that if they were killed in battle and their heads were cut off, because that's what you did to the enemy that were defeated, they wouldn't be mistaken for a woman's face and their heads wouldn't be thrown away, they would be collected and taken to the victor as a trophy. All right? But they would put the perfume on so that whoever killed them, and when they cut their heads off, it would release the perfume. And they wouldn't smell the overwhelming smell of blood. The samurai thought about the person who was going to cut their head off. All right? Think of that. that the samurai was known for several things. Archery, uh, of course, martial arts, which theirs was a kind of Aiki Jiu Jitsu, which was a martial art. Anyway, <laughs> but they, all, they were also known for their swordsmanship, of course, but they were also known for calligraphy, right? They were, they were some of the best calligraphers and painters of their time. They, they were also known for their poetry, right? Because, and the, the one other uh, art that was risen to an, to an art level that they were known for was the tea ceremony. Right? Which you think, what has that got to do with the warrior? It's not that. It is just like going into the military. What does marching in a line in step with everybody else have to do with warfare? Not a thing. Because when you're under fire, you ain't looking at everybody else's feet to make sure you're in step. Right? You are running, doing whatever you got to do. But it is the discipline that you learn from working as a team and the training you do. Now, years ago, because you will, you will fight the way you train. And so they train you all the same. So when you come under fire, hopefully everybody will react the same way. Now, years ago, there was a pilot that got shot down behind enemy lines. <clears throat> and the funny thing was, or not funny, but it's just the way it happened. When he was shot down, they lost all communication because he couldn't send out a beacon because the other people would pick it up and come find him. So, they said... He will be here, nowhere near the crash site. He will be here within two days during, between these hours. And this guy said, how do you know he's going to be there? And he said, because that's how he trained him. And so two days between those hours, they went there. He was waiting. They picked him up, took him out. Now, what does that mean? Why do you do the discipline? Why do you do the training ahead of time? Because when the time to fight comes, people have to know how you're going to react. Your, your fellow soldier has to know what you're going to do. 
and they have to be able to rely on you to do your training. That's the problem in the church. That's what the church doesn't understand. See, we've been talking a whole lot about individuality and you doing the job and you not letting people stop you and you not relying on other people. But the other aspect is we are all part of the body. And we need one another. And I, let me tell you, something we've noticed over the years, we have gone around the country and around the world and taught this. And every time we graduate a class, the, the other DHTs around the country end up saying, hey, did you just finish a DHT class? They'll call me and ask me. I'm like, yeah, I did two days ago. Why? Because, man, healing just got easier. What are we doing? We are raising the temperature of the body of Christ. You understand what I mean by that? And the more people we train, the more effect in the Spirit, because you are connected with them on the West Coast. And when you get trained and you get... Now, you got a choice. If you get trained and you get serious and you do your job, then not only do you help them, but they are connected with you and your healings come easier too. Why? Because it raises the whole body. Do you understand? That's how the body is supposed to operate. But if you don't do that, if we train you and I spend time here and then you don't do anything with it or you get lukewarm with it, well, it doesn't matter. Cause then you, you not only... Because now you're counted as part of the company, so to speak. And now not only do you not help us, you actually drain us. Do you realize, that, and I, I, I try to be careful with what I say things, I don't want to hurt anybody. But if we are part of the body, and you're part of me, then if you're sick, you weaken me. You understand? You don't have a right to be sick. You don't have a right to weaken the rest of the body. Right? Again, I'm not putting anybody under condemnation. I'm just saying, come out. Right? You can come out. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because I want you to understand. We have a part to play. Every person has their part, their role, and their job. What I'm teaching you is what a believer does. All right? I'm not talking about your specialties. That's our pro See, that's our problem. In, with the anointings and all this kind of stuff, we want specialties. Where, what's my gift? Where, where's my role? What's my thing? Okay. That'd be like somebody coming in and going, I'm going to join the military. Well, really, what do you want to do? I want to be a general. Okay, that's really not a job. <laughs> that's a position, right? And, well, you've got to go through basic. No, I don't want to do that. I just want to put on a pretty uniform and march around and tell people what to do. I'm like, what? Well, anyway, I was going to say something else, but never mind. <laughs> I was going to say, anyway, no. I'm tempted, anyway. But, every, see, we look at the five-fold ministry like it's something, and you ought to look at them like drill instructors. Right? They're there to serve you. You're not there to serve them. They are there to train you. Right? Now, Dr. Summerall used to say it this way. An apple tree doesn't need a, a tag or a sign to let it know it's an apple tree. Right? An apple tree knows it's an apple tree because it produces apples. Now, if an apple tree claims to be an apple, or if a tree claims to be an apple tree, and produces oranges. It's not an apple tree, no matter what you call it. And no matter what tag you put on it, it's not an apple tree. Is that right? All right. So there are people with pastor tags that ain't pastors. Right? There's people with prophet tags that ain't prophets. People with apostle tags that ain't apostles. You are what you do. If you don't do nothing, well, that's what you are. All right? Now, when you come into the body of Christ, everybody comes in the same way. We're all believers. Now, we think that if I come in as a believer and then I progress up to maybe an apostle, that'd be great. Okay? You can see it that way in some ways. But you're kind of looking at it opposite. It's not climbing the ladder to apostleship. It's actually digging down. You understand? And if you get dead enough, you might be an apostle. You understand? But everybody comes in as a believer. The believer is the one Jesus always talked about. Jesus didn't talk about apostles much. Right? And he didn't talk about being an apostle and all that kind of stuff. He talked about being a believer. And the believer is God's big guy. The believer is... See, the soldier is the important one. Okay. Generals can be replaced. Right? But it's soldiers that win battles. You understand? It's not technology. It is the will and the spirit of the soldier that wins battles, right? Because a general can yell charge all he wants. But if the soldier doesn't have the spirit to fight, ain't nothing going to happen. It is the soldier that counts. You understand? 
We want, we want to come in and we want to be the prophet, the evangelist, the whatever. And we want people to call us by that title. Right? But if a prophet hadn't been a soldier, okay, then he's not going to be a prophet. Everybody goes through basic. Everybody's a soldier. Uh, for, before you go into Ephesians 4, go to Mark chapter 16. You understand what I mean? I'm not telling you to go there. I'm saying before you try to be one of the fivefold ministry, go to Mark 16 and do the job description of a believer. Because until you fulfill that job description, you're not getting promoted to one of the fivefold. You understand? And every fivefold minister is going to be a soldier. Every fivefold minister is going to act like a believer. See, being in fivefold ministry doesn't give me more power. You understand that? I have no more spiritual power because of my office than as a believer. My office doesn't give me more power. It gives me more responsibility. The Bible says don't be many teachers. Knowing that the teachers are going to receive the greater condemnation. Isn't that right? Now, it says, so our job is to first and foremost, always remember, a general that cannot be a soldier can't be a general. I don't care what you put on him. I don't care what tag, what, what stars or anything. You understand what I'm saying? So, now, go with me real quick. Where did I tell you to go while I go? Anywhere? No? Good. Okay, we're... T- <clears throat> go to James real quick. I don't know. What are y'all doing the next three days? We might have to actually <laughs> stay over. <clears throat> Go to James chapter 5. Let me, let me give you a, a job description here. In verse 13. It says, Is any among you afflicted? James 5, 13. Now, notice. Is any among you afflicted? What is he supposed to do? Let him pray. Okay? Now notice... Next one. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Watch. Is any sick among you? Stop right there. Notice, sick, being sick is not being afflicted. Right? That's not being afflicted. Because if it was, he couldn't put them both in there, both in verse 14 and verse 13. Because he gave different remedies for each one. So they can't be the same thing. Right? Now, Afflicted means persecuted. Okay? Sickness is not affliction. Persecution is... It says, look, if you're afflicted, pray. Okay? And if you pray if you're afflicted, persecuted, what's going to happen? God's going to say, my grace is sufficient. Right. Isn't that right? Yeah. Then he says, any Mary? Sing. If you're sick, what do you do? <laughs> Let him, who? The sick. Call for the who? Elders. The elders of the church. And let... Them, who? The elders. Okay. Pray over him. Now notice it doesn't say let the sick pray over himself. It says, if you're... Now, let me explain what James is. When people get saved, usually the people tell them, alright, what you need to do first is read the Gospel of John. Read through John. Alright. If a person gets saved, I never tell them to read John. John said, these things are written that you might believe that he is the Christ. When they get saved, they believe he's the Christ. So that he doesn't need to read John at that point. Now, as a new believer, he needs to read James. Okay? James, why? Because James is the perfect primer for the entire Christian life. Everything you need to know about how to live the Christian life is in the book of James. Five short chapters. It's a short book. You're not going to scare them. You know? Here, read this book. 21 chapters. I don't want it. No, just five little chapters. Read this. This is a basic instruction manual of how to live the Christian life. Tells you everything. It says, listen, watch your tongue. Watch your mouth. And it right says? It says, listen, somebody comes in, you don't treat the rich better than you treat the poor. Now, isn't this telling you how to live the basic Christian life? Right? And then he says, look, if you're afflicted, if you're undergoing under persecution, here's what you do. What do you, you pray. If you're merry, if you're happy, if everything's going good, what do you do? You sing. Right? Now, if you're sick, what do you do? You see, this is all... Right? You call for the elders, and the elders come. Now, mature Christians don't need elders praying for them. Right? The mature Christians are the ones that's doing the praying. 
So this is talking about young new believers and telling them what to do. Now watch what he says. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now why would the sick person need why would this person need oil? Because they're new and the oil represents the presence and the acceptance of the Holy Spirit. So it shows that this person they're doing this to is brand new. He's a new believer, doesn't know a whole lot, and he still needs some physical things to show him that he can connect with. All right? And it says, Let him, and they will anoint, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now watch. And the prayer of faith. Now, who's going to pray the prayer of faith? The elders. The elders. Right? It doesn't say the sick person. It says the elders. And the prayer of faith, prayed by the elders, shall save the sick. Right? So the prayer by the elders is what's going to heal this person. It does not say condemn this person for not being able to get healed on their own. They should call for the elders. Now get this. The elders are supposed to go to them, pray over them, anoint them with oil, and watch what's going to happen. And the Lord shall raise him up. Right? So if the elders pray the prayer of faith, this person is going to get healed. Right? And if he doesn't get healed, they didn't pray the prayer of faith. Isn't that right? Now, if a person can't pray the prayer of faith and get a person healed, they can't be an elder. You understand? Is that what that says? It says the elders got to be able to heal the sick. They can't get the sick healed, they can't be an elder. People say, see, being an elder isn't what my man said. Oh, I'm making you an elder. No, it's who God says. Amen. Right? And the person that can get a person healed, guess what? They can be an elder. All right? Now, there's other requirements and things and all that stuff. But I'm saying, even if they fulfill all the others, if they can't get the sick healed, can't be an elder. Right? Is it, come on, is this simple? I told you I believe the Bible exactly what it's written. All right. He says, now watch this. And if he has committed sins, that means that all sickness isn't caused by sin. Right? If he's committed sins, now watch, they shall be forgiven him. You know what's amazing about this? It doesn't say that he's repented or asked for forgiveness. It says he's going to get it when they anoint him and pray over him. Now see, this will scare you. Because Jesus said, Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Isn't that right? Didn't he say that? I know you don't like it. Because it scares you. It makes you think we're going Catholic again. Right? But that's what he said. Well, the retaining doesn't mean that you tell them, oh, I'm, no, I'm not going to forgive your sin. You're going to go to hell with that sin and I'm going to see to it. Okay, that's not what he's talking about. Right? He's saying if, if, if you don't go tell them their sins have been forgiven, then they're going to die in their sins and the blood's on your hands. That's what it says in Ezekiel. Is this is right? Okay. He says, and they shall be forgiven him. Now, now notice. This man was, now he's sick, and, and he could have committed sins, right? Because it says if he's committed sins, that means he did, but he could have. But it says here, now notice the funny thing is, he got healed before he got forgiven. Isn't that right? It says, the Lord shall raise him up, and if he's committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So what, now we would have put that verse about forgiven sins and stuff, that we, today we would have put that at the beginning. Right? But God who inspired James, put that at the end. Which means you can get healed before you, before, even before your sins get forgiven. Isn't that right? See? This, that verse right there destroys a whole lot of healing teaching already. Well, you've got to get that sin out before you can get healed. If you don't get sin out, if, there's a, if you don't get healed, it's because there's still sin. Now, if I don't get healed and you're praying for me, it's because you're not praying in faith. Not because I didn't get the sin out, it's because you didn't pray in faith. Amen? Is this, is this what the Scripture says? Alright. Then he goes on and says, Confess your faults one to another. And pray for one another. Now look at this. Now he's talking about praying for other people. That you may be healed. Okay, now this is the next level up. This is a person who is maturing. And he says, now, here's how you can talk to each other. You confess each other's faults, you know, to each other. The mistakes you've made. Now this is mainly talking about, it's two things. It's talking about, on a spiritual level, it is talking about two people come back together and making up. I've wronged you, you've wronged me, I forgive you, you forgive me. And it says they shall be healed. Well, the, the healing it's talking about there is not physical, it's talking about spirit. They're, they are being uh, you know, reconciled, yeah. You see what I'm saying? That their, their relationship is healed, as we would say. But on the physical level, it is also that you can pray for one another. Isn't that amazing? Now, let me show you the one this works. 
Now I've got to send you to break again. <laughs> Actually, it's almost time to go home. <clears throat> well, when you... The, okay, we actually had the question asked, why, does it, why is it harder sometimes to get family healed than it is other people? Well, it's two reasons. One is, they know you too well. Okay? And familiarity is, you know, a prophet in his own hometown kind of thing. And so they just don't respect you and they don't put any stock in you whatsoever. All right? Now, and if they don't have any faith in you, then they may get healed, but it's not going to be on their faith. Right? And, you, and then on your side, you know them too well and you can think of too many reasons why God shouldn't heal them. Okay? That's why it's so hard to get family healed, honestly. And that's why when you come up to me and you start telling me, well, I did this and I did that. Okay, you know, unless I ask you, don't tell me. Because if you tell me too much, you may convince me that you don't deserve to be healed. And you know, you're going to talk me out of faith and I'm going to, you know... Try, but and see the other thing is the other aspect of that is if you if you give me all your problems, then I have to struggle to stay in the spirit and not get over in the soul. Because see, soul feels pity and sympathy. Spirit has compassion. So, see, nobody gets healed when you pray out of your soul. Matter of fact, they usually end up dying, especially if it's terminal. Because, and, and when you pray for loved ones, it's almost always out of your soul. Uh, soul doesn't get anybody healed. Okay? You have to pray out of the Spirit. Spirit heals. Soul does not heal. Okay? If you pray out of your Spirit, you'll pray out of compassion. If you pray out of your soul, you pray out of pity and sympathy. Now, and, and I'll come back into this in just a second to, to detail this. When you pray for your loved ones, you know, children, family, that kind of stuff, you almost always start out at least praying out of soul. Almost every time. And that's why you don't see healing. Because you're praying... Now, get it, this is going to sound so weird to you, okay? But when you start praying out of your soul, you are praying for them to be healed because you love them. And you think, well, doesn't, isn't that, shouldn't that heal them? No, no, no. It's not this kind of love. It's this kind of love. You understand? It's soulish love. You want them healed because you love them. Right? That doesn't get anybody healed. When I learned to pray for my own family, the same way I prayed for other people's family, I started getting my family healed. You say, what, what do you mean? Shouldn't you love your family more than you do others? So why didn't they get... Okay, it's because it's not that kind of love. My love for my family is earthly love. It's, it's soulish. I have, a, I have a, a, a brotherly love, a, a family love for them. And I want them healed because I love them. But when I go pray for somebody else, I don't know them well enough to love them like family. So I rely on loving them with the love of God. And when I do that, I want them healed, not because I want them healed because I love them, but I want them healed because Jesus died to buy it. That's the basis that gets people healed. When, when I pray, when I minister to people like that, and I want them healed because Jesus deserves them to be healed because He bore their sickness. That's the basis of healing. Not the basis of love. I told you it'd sound weird. Because I, I know you've heard before, we got love. Oh yeah. yeah, but you know, faith which works by love. That's it. Okay, wait. I'm glad you brought that up. We need to talk about it. The, now, the Bible doesn't say that faith always works by love. It says, when Paul was talking about it, he says, faith, that faith which works by love. He, Paul said, look, he said, if I have all faith to give my body to be burned, to give away all my goods, to do all these things, it profits me nothing if I don't have love. Right? So that means he could do all that and his faith would work and it not be operating by love. So faith does not operate by love. Faith operates. But for you to get credit for it, it must operate by love. You understand? So faith, faith does not just automatically operate by love. Faith can operate without love. Okay? Judas had faith without love. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, okay, but I'm assuming because he was stealing and committed suicide. Okay? Turned Jesus in, all that stuff. 
Does this make sense to you? Do, you? do you see what I'm getting at? Because if you start to pray for people, when you learn to pray, okay, you've got to love people, James says, impartially. If you pray for your baby harder than you pray for your neighbors, that's not love without partiality. That's partial love. I'm more partial to my baby than I am your baby, you see? But when I can pray for your baby and get it healed, and then come home and pray for my baby on the same basis that my baby deserves to be healed because Jesus bore its sickness, the same way your baby deserved to be healed because Jesus bore it, instead of because I love my baby. See, that's why most people that love someone find it so hard to get them healed because they're praying out of their soulish love rather than the basis of healing, which is by His stripes. See, that's the key. That, does that help? You understand that? Now, alright, somebody's calling me here. I got, nope, do it later. <laughs> now, where was, oh, okay, we sent you to First Corinthians, or I'm sorry, to uh, James. I've, I'm going to try to get you into First Corinthians, chapter 3, okay? Go back there real quick. I'll try to get this done. If we go a little bit over 5, is that okay? Just a little bit. I'll try to get it done as quickly as possible, but... All right? You're not going to jump up and everybody run out at 5 o'clock? Okay. All right, how are we doing on time there, brother? What, what, what time we got? 56 minutes. 56 minutes? That's pretty good. I mean, we'll get it done way before then, but... Okay, I just want to make sure we weren't going to run out. Okay. 1 Corinthians, <clears throat> chapter 2. Paul, writing to the Corinthians. Now, remember, the Corinthian church was messed up. Really messed up. All kinds of problems. And Paul was writing to them. Actually... Now, without confusing you, okay, 1 Corinthians is actually 2 Corinthians. And 2 Corinthians is actually 3 Corinthians, okay? Because the original first letter Paul wrote to, to Corinth somehow got lost and wasn't included in the canon. So our first letter is actually his second letter, and our second letter is actually his third letter, okay? You totally confused now? Okay. But we're in 1 Corinthians, which is the first letter that was actually found and kept, Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and Paul's writing to them. That's why when Paul wrote to them in 1 Corinthians, a lot of the things he says sounds like he's answering questions before, and it's because he had already writ written back and forth to them with questions and problems, and he was trying to straighten out the church because it's so messed up. And really, if, if we had third, or 1 Corinthians to 3 Corinthians today, it would have been the, the most letters and words written to any church. Okay, Now, think about this. If there had not, almost every letter was written in response to a major problem, crisis, or er doctrinal error that was going on. So, thank God for messed up churches. Right? Because if there had not been messed up churches, we wouldn't have the Bible. Because every letter was written in response to a major problem. Right? So, you don't always blast churches because they're messed up. You know, you think back and think, well, if it wasn't for messed up, come on, it... You're not going to find a perfect church. And if you do, please don't join it because it won't be perfect anymore. All right. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 1. Paul writing to the Corinthians says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined, and listen, he made a choice. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, Paul could have talked a whole lot of stuff, right? He was a brilliant man, but he said, Listen, when I came to you, you know I didn't tell you anything but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Why? Because it's the simplicity of the gospel that counts, not your vast knowledge. Amen? That's why most uh, healing seminars are geared toward showcasing the teacher's vast knowledge of details. Okay? Now, I don't know a lot of details like that, but I'll tell you this. I got some things that work. Amen? And, and the thing is, what I'm trying to produce in you and what most seminars try to produce in you are two different things. They try to produce specialists. Know this, know that, do it this way, do it this way, here, and we're going here. This disease or this sin causes this, and it goes over here, and it causes that root, and this cause, and you go back into here, and this generational curve. You see what I'm saying? It, it tries to create specialists. I am not trying to create specialists. I'm trying to create general practitioners. Amen? I don't want you to be able to handle a few things that come along. I want you to be able to handle anything that comes along, and you can't do that as a specialist. Amen? 
So don't try to show off your knowledge when you go out there to minister. They don't care what you know. All they want to know is, can you get this off of me? And once you get it off of them, then they may ask you more questions. But if you can't, move on. And you know what I mean by that? Don't try to dazzle them with your brilliant exegesis. Okay? Try to show them the simplicity of the gospel. Right? Now, he says, verse 3, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Why? Verse 5, That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, do you hear that? It is okay for you and your faith to stand in the power of God and not just in talk. People say, well, don't just go after power, you know, because that, no, you got you to be balanced, bro. No. He said, my faith should stand in the power of God, not in how well someone can speak. Amen? Because there's some good orators out there. Amen? Some people that can, can you go to the Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall, those people can talk. You know what I mean? And they can rattle out Scripture and yet not have a clue to the truth of who Jesus is or what He can do. Amen? So you can't just go... I used to pray that. I, when, growing up, I prayed, God... Because I read about these men that... that George, um, Jonathan Edwards would preach, you know, sinners in the hands of an angry God. And he, it was in the middle of winter with snow on the ground and he'd be preaching and he was almost blind so he had to hold his... He, he wrote his sermon out and he had to hold it up like this. And he'd be preaching and he's talking about the fires of hell and sinners going down into hell and all that. And when he... Put it down. But he was so convincing by reading. He didn't even preach. He just read. He was so convincing that the people in the church literally... And there's snow outside. And they were hanging on to the pillars of the church in the, inside the, the uh, sanctuary. And literally sweating. Because they could feel the fires of hell under their feet. Just by what he read. And they were hanging on the pillars afraid they were going to fall off into hell. Now that's preaching. Amen? That, that's some oratorical skills, okay? <clears throat> now, and I, I was praying, God, make me like that. Get, make me an orator. And, 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 you know, I read and these different things. And, and you know, I, I went in, I read the dictionary. I was in the hospital, got my papers taken out, read the dictionary, read Sherlock Holmes and that kind of stuff. But I wanted to be an orator. God, make me an orator. God, I want to be able to move men towards you. And God told me, He said, stop praying that. And I thought, why? And he said, I have enough orators that speak to God, to, that speak to men's heads. I need you to speak to men's hearts. And he said, head reaches head. Heart reaches heart. And so I just quit praying. After that I started praying Luke, was it? I can't remember the verse now, but it was where it said that, that uh, God gave him wisdom against which no man could gainsay. And I started praying that. I've been praying that since I was 17. And to this day, I have presented this message, what I'm preaching to you, to theologians across the country, even around the world now. I've told them, you find, you find mistakes in here, you find something wrong, you tell me, I'll change it, you'll fix it. And to this day, without fail, every one of them has said, we've listened to it, we've torn it apart, trying to find something wrong, and we can't find one thing in there. That, matter of fact, Michael Brown from uh, Fire School, you know who I'm talking about, the Pensacola Revival and all that? I, I t teach it there Bible school regularly. And he said, I asked him, I said, if you see anything in there that I need to change, you let me know. And he said, your message is scripturally flawless. No, he said, it's yeah, scripturally accurate and theologically flawless. Right? And I said, well, that's pretty amazing because I've never even been to Bible school. And he just laughed. And he said, I've been in Bible school all my life. And he said, this is good stuff. And so they bring me in regular to teach and so I do that. Anyway, but that's God. That's his, it's his word. That's why I said, if I do my job right, it ain't Curry Blake. It's the Spirit of God talking to you. You understand? That's why it's not a matter for you to choose whether or not you're going to obey it. Your only choice is, is it truth? That's the only choice. Not, well, I like that, or I don't like his attitude, or I, I don't like his you know, presentation. Forget all that. Listen to the message. Is it right? If it's right, that's the only thing. After that, because you've already said yes to him. So it's not a matter of will you do it. It's, is it right? Because if it's right, you're doing it. Amen? If he's your Lord, you've got to do what he said. Simple as that. Okay. He says, where are we at? Verse 5. Yeah. Going into 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. 
And he called them perfect even though they were messed up. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Alright? Now, just as a side note there, if you get the um, SWAT series of spiritual warfare, and I, how I say, remember I've been telling you this is all warfare? Okay, if you read this, none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, in military terms, that's called an ambush. They didn't know that they were causing their own downfall. He led them into a trap and ambushed them. All right? Pure military tactics. Okay? All right. He says, but, now watch this, as it is written. Now you see this? This is an Old Testament scripture, and he's quoting from the Old Testament. And he's sitting from the Old Covenant, right? He says, but as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Now, people say, oh yes, amen, that's true. Okay, now watch. Verse 10. First word, but. Right? Now, notice this. <clears throat> I think we may even mentioned this the other day. If I told you, or you came to me and said, uh, Brother Craig, you got $5, I need $5 to do this. And I, and I said, yeah, man, I got $5, I'd love to give it to you, no problem. It ain't going to hurt me to give it to you. I'd love to give it to you. I've got the $5, matter of fact, i got it right here. But, but. And when I say but, what does that mean? You ain't getting the $5. Ain't that right? No matter how long I told you I wanted to give it to you. When I said but, what that means is forget everything I just said and now I'm going to tell you the truth and the facts. Ain't that right? That's what it means. Paul is quoting the Old Testament. He says, I hath not seen, neither has ear heard, neither has it entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. We hear that quoted all the time in church. Oh, we don't know what God has prepared for us. Oh, we don't know God's thoughts are above our thoughts, his ways above our ways. Okay, that's what, that's old covenant. That was unborn again people. If your God's ways aren't your ways, you're not saved. You understand? The way of the transgressor is hard, but the way of the righteous is blessed. Amen? So you, can't, you couldn't say all that stuff. Now back then in the Old Covenant, they could because they weren't born again. And His ways was above it. His thoughts were above their thoughts. But that's not you. Because you have His Spirit. And if you have His Spirit, you can have His thoughts. Alright? Now watch. He says, But God hath, past tense, I mean it's already done, revealed them, what? The things that I hadn't seen and ear hadn't heard and the things that God has prepared for those that love Him. Right? That hadn't entered the hearts of men. But God has revealed these things to us by His Spirit. So you can't say, well, you know, I hadn't seen your near hadn't. God works in mysterious ways. Yeah, to people that don't know Him. Right? To people that know Him, He's not mysterious at all. He says, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So in other words, anything you've learned about God, you got it by the Spirit. You didn't figure it out. The Spirit revealed it. Okay? Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Why? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Do you hear that? Thing, he gave us the Spirit so we could know what He has freely given us. Not things we have to buy from Him, not things we have to work for, but things that are freely given to us. The purpose of the Spirit is so you can know these things. Amen? Alright. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, let me just explain something. If someone walked in that door, maybe their car broke down and they'd come in here for help or something, and they heard us in here talking, and we're talking about laying hands on the sick and tumors disappearing and, you know, dead raising and all that kind of stuff, and this person just off the street, don't know nothing, all right? They're going to stand back there and think, this is crazy. This is, this is, I've never heard anything like that. You know, they're, they're going to be thinking, 
healing. Yeah, I know healing. It's a scalpel in a doctor's hand. It's, it's a shot. It's medicine. That's healing. What are they talking about laying hands? These people actually think that they're going to put their hand on a person and sickness is going to disappear. That's crazy. But look at you. You're here learning it. See how far you've already come from where you used to be? That's the difference. See, you've already, now this seems normal to you. You know, thinking about healing, thinking about God, thinking about power, and that, normal. And used to, to, to an average person, that is light years away from where they are. Isn't that right? And here you're like, well, I don't know anything. I don't know that much. I just Look how far you've come. Amen? This is normal to you. Now, he says, But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. Talking in tongues? Your loved ones is unsaved. I, I, that's gibberish. I don't get it. That makes no sense. Well, there's your verse. Of course I don't get it. They're natural. It's foolishness to them. Quit trying to explain it. Just live it and let them see it, what it does in your life. Right? They don't care about the explanation. <clears throat> they are foolishness to them. Neither can he know them. Because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things. Alright, stop right there. Next time somebody says, well, right, we shouldn't judge. Okay, well, when you get spiritual, you can judge. Right? I'm spiritual, I'm going to judge. The spiritual man judges all things. I'm judging all things. Well, yeah, but you shouldn't judge other people. Well, I'm not judging you of you going to hell. I'm not telling you that. But I can judge. You keep living this way, you will end up in hell. Come on. Right? I can, I can judge your actions. I can judge your lifestyle. And I'm not telling you you are going to hell no matter what. Because that's judging you and pronouncing a final sentence. But I can tell you this. You stay on that path, you'll end up in hell. You need to turn around. Right? I'm judging your actions. I'm judging your fruit. Right? Now, if you say I'm judging you, that's because you and the fruit with you is pretty close. All right? He says, but he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For Now watch this. Again, he quotes an Old Testament verse. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? And what's the next word? But. But we have the mind of Christ. Now you're going to notice, you go through all of Paul's writings, and every time he quotes an Old Testament verse, almost every time the next word is but. Why? Because the Old Covenant, he said, look, used to be that was true. But no more. Why? Because the old covenant has passed away and we have a new covenant. Alright? Now, remember, and watch this. He says, And I, brethren, now listen, this is the important part. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. You hear that? But as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So what do we got? We got spiritual, then we got carnal. Now we know that carnal, according to this, to be carnal is to be a baby in Christ. So if being carnal, if you got spiritual and carnal, and carnal is a babe, what is spiritual? Mature, right? Now watch. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. Okay, why? For hitherto, that means up till now, you were not able to bear it. And neither yet now are you able. Alright, stop right there. Now notice what we got. We got spiritual, carnal. We got... He says, you're a baby in Christ if you're carnal. So that means if you're spiritual, you're mature in Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Then he says, okay, I couldn't give you meat. I could only give you milk because you're a babe. Well, a baby drinks milk. So that means that whenever you mature, you're going to eat meat. Right? So meat is connected with mature, with spiritual. Milk is connected with carnal and with being a baby. Right? Now Paul said, you are carnal. You're babes in Christ. And I could not give you meat because you're babes. As a matter of fact, you couldn't bear it up till now. And even now, I cannot give you meat. Isn't that right? But he's writing a letter to him. And in this letter, it's amazing because we just read this letter and we say, Oh yeah, oh we're going to study this. Now we're getting into this. And this letter, this word means this in the Greek. And people are, oh man, we're getting the meat now. Oh, this is meat. Oh, we're digging this stuff out. Okay. Excuse me, but you cannot find meat where Paul said he didn't put any. Right? Paul said there is no meat in Corinthians. You get that? You can't dig. There's no meat in this book. You get that? There's no meat there. You do not find anywhere in the Bible where it says, eat the meat of the word. You know what it says? Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. 
See, this whole book is milk. No meat. No meat in this book. Not at all. You say, wait a minute, Kerr, you're scaring me. No, you're coming alive. Right? We're peeling those layers off. Let me prove it to you. He says, <clears throat> Neither yet now are you able. That means there's no milk, I mean, no meat in Corinthians. For you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? Oh, wait a minute. What's wrong with walking as men? You're never told to be a man. You're told to walk as sons of God. Matter of fact, one translation even says, And you walk as mere mortal men. Why? Because you're not mere mortal men. Okay? If you're born again, you've already died. Right? You're going to live from now on. Right? Now, your physical body may or may not. Who knows about that? But I'll tell you this. You ain't dying. Right? Because you've already tasted death. And you won't taste it anymore. If you believe in me, right? If, even though he were dead, yet shall he live? Right? All right, now watch this. He says, For while one says, I'm of Paul, and another says, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed? Even as the Lord gave to every man, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And then he goes on. Now, he just said, I couldn't give you meat here in chapter 3, right? And he said, I couldn't include it in there, so there is no meat here. But, nine chapters later, he talks about the gifts of the Spirit. So even the gifts of the Spirit, now get this, what did he do with the gifts of the Spirit? He detailed what they were. But even that is not meat. You get it? Information cannot be meat. Alright, watch. Go with me to Hebrews. <clears throat> and actually, this is in your manual too. I mean, we're in chapter 2 of your manual. I think it's page 7. If you look in there, you can follow right along. And it'll go right along to it and it'll show you, you know, where we're going. But go to Hebrews chapter 5. Y'all getting anything out of this? Is this okay? <clears throat> All right, but hang in there with me for just a couple more minutes. We'll try to get this done. Hebrews chapter 5. <clears throat> We're going to start about verse 11. And you can go back in and read all this because, again, I don't have time to do it all and I want you to know that I'm reading it in context. So go back and read it. But in verse 11, remember we've been talking about Melchizedek and how Jesus came after the order of Melchizedek and now he talks about the order of Melchizedek as a high priest. Verse 11, he says... Of whom, talking about Melchizedek, we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. You hear that? He, he's not saying it's hard for me to say. He's saying it'd be hard for me to explain it to you because it'd be hard for you to hear it. I could tell you, but you wouldn't get it. Okay? He says, now, now he's going to tell you why you wouldn't get it. He says, for when for the time, in other words, there's a length of time here, you ought to be teachers. You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. In other words, he's telling these Hebrew Christians, look, you've been Christian long enough that you ought to be teaching others, and he says it to all of them, so all Christians should be teachers. You hear that? Why? Because all believers are supposed to be making disciples. Everybody in this room ought to have a disciple. Every one of you ought to be getting people born again and raising them up in Christ. Not getting them born again, or bringing them to church to get them born again, or, or getting them born again and then bringing them to church and saying, here you go, pastor, raise them up. No, that's your job. And you'll be surprised how much you will grow once you take responsibility for the spiritual growth of somebody. And you have to start praying for them and being there for them. So, he says, in other words, he said, you should have been teachers already and I have to come back here because you have become dull of hearing and I have to teach you what are the very basics all over again. He said, and have be now watch this, and have become such. They weren't always this way. So it shows the spiritual maturity is fluctuating, right? He says, and become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So he's telling them, he said, you guys have basically backslid to the point where you need milk again. He says, for every... Now he tells us what, what it is about milk and everything. But everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness because he is a baby. Right? Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about the Word of God, right? Spiritual milk. We're not talking about physical milk. We're talking about spiritual milk. Okay. Now, it, says, it doesn't say you're unskillful in the Word of God. It says you're unskillful in the Word of righteousness. In other words, once you understand who you are in Christ, that you are the righteousness of God in Christ, and you understand righteousness, which is the Word of God. The Word of righteousness is the Word of God. But once you understand the Word of God based on the righteousness of God in Christ, then everything changes, and you're no longer a baby after that. But until then, you're still a baby. 
Okay? He says, watch this, but strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. Means mature. Even those who by reason of use. Hear that? Who get strong meat? People who use something, right? By reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, by reason of use. In other words, you get your you, you understand the word of righteousness, and you start doing what's right. And as you do what is right, you can understand this is right, that's wrong. It's no longer theory. It's no longer well. I don't know. I'm not sure. What do you think? And you can tell that's right, that's wrong. This is good, that's evil. Well, that sickness is that of God or is it of the devil? I don't know. Well, it's working something good in their life, so it could be of God. But you know, it's also costing a lot of money. They were going to send off to missions, so it might be of the devil. I don't know. Okay, you're still a babe in Christ. You're still needing milk and not strong meat. All right? Now watch. Then he says, remember, chapter's not divine. Therefore, leaving the principles, leaving the basics of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. That word perfection means maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Okay, that's the foundation, repentance from dead works. Say, look, we're not going to go back and talk about repenting from dead works and turning away from that. We're not gonna, I'm not going to be talking about that. And of faith towards God. Now wait a minute. He says don't, don't keep preaching about faith towards God. He said I, you, you're telling me I'm going to move away from that. In other words there should come a point where I don't have to teach about faith in God. Yeah as soon as you teach it people are to walk in it. And you shouldn't have to keep teaching it. Because people are walking in it. But if you stop teaching faith in God. It, come on if you took out faith in God preaching. Every church would shut down next Sunday. Because that's what they keep telling you. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Isn't it right? But at some point, we've got to quit preaching about it and actually everybody start doing it. Right? And then we can move away from talking about it and actually doing it. Right? I, I always tell everybody, it's funny because Jesus said, when he returns, shall he find faith on the earth? And I tell him, well, I don't know if he's going to find faith, but he's going to find a whole bunch of books and tapes about it. <laughs> right? I don't know if he's going to find anybody actually walking in it, but... All right. And he says, now watch this, a faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do, if God permit. Do you realize, he's saying, look, let's move on, and let's move on past the basics. Do you realize these things are what's taught every Sunday everywhere? Why? Because we we'll always preach the lowest common denominator. If there's one person in there that's not saved, we'll come down to an evangelistic message. Rather than say, you know what, hang in here, we'll talk with you, but we've got to work with the believers. You know, maybe Sunday mornings ought to be evangelistic and Wednesday nights be for the believers. That'll work. But at some point, that's why believers never grow. It's because all, all they ever hear is just milk. Constant milk. You understand? All right. Now, go with me to John chapter 4. <clears throat> so what are we talking about? Spiritual maturity, right? Babes in Christ. Mature in Christ. Carnal, spiritual, milk, meat. Are we talking about physical meat or spiritual meat? Spiritual. Okay, just making sure you're listening. John, where are we going to go here? Yep, we're going to go to John chapter 4, verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Now do you realize that the church is still trying to be Jacob? Do we still want to wrestle with God? And they're right, we're always wrestling with God. Give me the blessing. God, give me the blessing. I'm wrestling with God. Okay, you don't have to wrestle for what you've been freely given. I mean, Ephesians 1.3. That God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Right? So does that mean you're lacking anything? Then we need to quit pulling on God and saying, God, give. And start saying, God, I'm going out to give. Amen? Alright. Now Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. Now, st stop here for a second. Think about this. Notice what he says. He said, now, it said, Jacob, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, being weary with his journey, sat thus on the well. Now, when you say sat thus, now, I thought this was really amazing, because, you know, textually, this shows how accurate the Bible is. Because he said, 
John, now when John wrote this, John didn't write it. John dictated it to his students, his disciples. And so they were writing it, so John is telling the story. Now, if this wasn't true, no one would think to write this. But the fact this is there proves it's true. Because he says, now, Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. Now, when you read that, sat thus on the well didn't tell you anything. Right? Didn't make any sense even. Sat thus on the well. But when you read it, and you realize what he was doing, he was telling the story. And he was telling it to his disciples, and they're writing it down. Now, he said, now, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, being weary with his journey, he sat thus on the well. He demonstrated to the disciples how Jesus sat. That's why he said he sat thus. See? Now, the disciples were so accurate in how they wrote it down, they didn't write down how Jesus sat. They wrote down exactly, word for word, what John said, which was, he sat thus on the well. Now, that shows you how accurate the Bible is, that they didn't even take the liberty to write in what they saw. They wrote what John said. Amen? Just shows you how accurate. All right. Doesn't mean anything about healing, but it's just neat. Okay? So, he says, Then, comes, then there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away in the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that said to him, to you, Give me to drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. Alright? Now, Notice, the reason he said living water is because to Jewish people, living water means running water. Okay? See, a Jewish person would never baptize the way we do. In a bathtub, you know, just still water. Because their idea was, and that's why I said when, Jesus, when John baptized Jesus, he baptized him in the Jordan where there was much water because it meant the water was running. Right? He didn't baptize him in a lake. It was a river. Running water. Why? Because when you got baptized, you had to go under the water, and the sins, now I know this sounds kind of funny in some ways, but they believed sin was like dirt. And it would rise to the surface, and as they went under, the sins would come off, and the running water would wash them away, and they would come out, and it would be clean water on them, and they'd be clean. Now, if it was just still water, when they go under, the sins rise to the top. When they come back out, the sins are still there and sticks to them. I know it sounds funny, but it's the way they thought. Okay? And Jesus said, I've asked you of drink, but if you knew who I was, you would ask me and I would give you living water, which means I'm going to give you water that's moving. Now watch this. He says, The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. Well, let me ask this first. When he said this living water, wasn't he talking about the Spirit? Later on, he, he mentions that and he says, and So what does that mean? It means the Spirit's always moving. Isn't it right? So if you're not moving, you're not waiting on the Spirit. Right? He's moving. Right? And you've got to catch up with him. Okay. The woman said unto him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank there of himself, and his children, and his cattle? Now, Jesus was the only person that could have said, Yep, sure am. You figured it out, lady. But you notice, he had no ego. Because he didn't even talk about him. He went right, he skipped right over that and said, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Right? But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Do you get that? Now, now listen carefully. He said... If you drink that water, you're going to thirst again. But if you drink the water I give you, which is the Spirit, because he's talking about everlasting life, he's talking about salvation. Right? He said, and he said, look, if you drink the water that I give you, it'll be a well, it'll come up into everlasting life, and you will never thirst again. Right? Now, how many of you have heard people sing songs, Lord, I'm so thirsty. Lord, my heart pants after you like the deer. 
Lord, I, we live in a dry and thirsty land. Send your rain. Oh, Lord, I'm so thirsty. Lord, we thirst. Lord, we hunger. Lord, Lord, we thirst after you. Right? Okay, if, if, you're, if you've been singing that, stop it. You understand? Unless you're not born again. Only a sinner, unborn again, can sing that song. Because every... Now, you, you need to listen. I'm not just talking here saying cute little things, okay? Jesus said, if you drink the water I give you, if you get saved and you have my spirit, you will never thirst again. And if you get down on Sunday and you start singing how you're thirsting, you are denying Christ. You are saying, I am not saved. You understand that? You're saying, I don't have his spirit. Now, this is real simple. There is no difference between singing a lie and telling one. Amen. Right? Is this pure enough or simple, bold, blunt, what do you want to call it? Right? Matter of fact, next time they start singing it, just stand up and go, moo. Because that is a sacred cow. Okay? <laughs> now, he says, <clears throat> the woman said, the woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Now she's still thinking physical water, isn't she? I mean, she's, she's not thinking spirit. And Jesus said unto her, Go call your husband and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said unto her, You've well said that you don't have a husband, because you've had five husbands. And the man that you have now is not your husband. So in, the, in saying that, you've said truly. And now watch this. The woman said, said unto him, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Well, isn't that something? He just called her an adulterer or adulteress, right? He just revealed her sin. And what does she say? First thing she says, well, you're a prophet, right? Now watch this. Now you would think if he just revealed her sin, she would say, you're right. I repent. This ain't right. Got to change, right? That's what you would think. No, she was a good religious person. Watch this. The woman says, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. And she goes right into the hot topic, the hot religious topic of the day. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. Okay, no mention of the sin. Right? Forget the sin, that's over here. We, we, we want to talk about this. Right? Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you say, the Jews say, that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Isn't it funny how she just totally ignored the fact that he exposed her sin? Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me. The hour comes when you will neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You hear that? It's not about a place. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. In other words, it's coming through the Jews. But the hour comes and now is. Right? Hear that? It's not coming, it now is. When the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship Him. Now hear that? The Father seeks. Right? Now, the Bible says that God sent His Son while we were yet in our sin. Right? He loved us before we loved Him. Right? He sought us before we sought Him. Isn't that right? Isn't it funny because we... Years ago there was a book about being a God chaser. And about how... Oh, we've got to be a God chaser. We've got to chase God. I don't know about you, but... God chased me for years. And then finally I gave up and said, you're right. And, right. and we know this because you know, we've had kids at different times. And it's like, oh, pl you know, please pray for you know, little Johnny. He's running from God. Hmm. If he's running from God, it sounds like God's chasing him. Right? Isn't it funny? We always talk about, well, we've got to be a God chaser. We've got we to go after God. I'm not a God chaser. God chased me. He, you know, and I was smart enough at some point eventually to give up, 